I want to offer you a warm welcome from everyone at the APF and everyone here today. Um, Dr. Busney is um, the director of the Dermatology Associates at Brigham and Women's um, Hospital in Boston. And she's also the president of the Photodermatology Society. And she is um, a favorite among patients because she takes so much time to listen to them and take time with them in her appointments. So I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, she she is gonna, she's definitely a favorite. So thank you for being here today. That's very nice. I didn't know you were going to say that. That's very yeah. lovely. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll get started. So I'm going to be talking about uh, erythropoietic protoporphyria. And actually, I need to be able to see my slides. So I'm going to minimize this. And when I do that, I'm not going to be able to see anyone's faces. Um, so um, Nicole, please just stop me if there's if there's any issues. OK. OK. All right. Sounds good. So we'll start off with a discussion. Then we'll go to some Q&A. All right, so I thought I would start off with how I became involved with EPP because I think that that does matter. And oh, I just want to say erythropoietic protoporphyria is abbreviated as EPP. When I say EPP, I also am going to be referring to XLP or X-linked protoporphyria. And rather than write them both at the same time, every time I'm going to um, use them, uh, use EPP to refer to both, except when I differentiate the reason I say that is that EPP and XLP have very similar um, clinical symptoms and are treated very much the same. Okay, sorry. So um, I became involved uh, with EPP because of my interest in light, um, how light can both cause and treat cutaneous disease. Um, so I am a, I'm the president of the Photodermatology Society. Um, I am a member of the Photobiology Committee from the Skin Cancer Foundation, and I'm a member of the Sunscreen Work Group uh, um, of the American Academy of Dermatology. And actually, in my clinical dermatology practice, I use um, ultraviolet light called phototherapy to treat inflammatory conditions of the skin, like psoriasis and eczema. So really, both sides of the spectrum, how light can both be harmful and helpful um, to the skin. Um, I am a dermatologist. Uh, I am. I am. I am not a hepatologist or a hematologist, and I, I just want to to make that clear that I work with incredible uh, colleagues in a multidisciplinary team, um, and and I go to them for a lot of questions which are related uh, to the liver or to the blood. All right. So let's get started. Uh, what are the porphyrias? So the porphyrias are a group of metabolic disorders caused by altered activity of enzymes in the heme biosynthetic pathway. It is very complicated, this pathway, but let's start off with what is heme and why is it important to hemoglobin? Well, hemoglobin is what carries oxygen in our bloodstream from the lungs to the tissues. And a hemoglobin molecule is made up of four heme groups, and here they are, they're in green, which surround a globin group. Um, so this is heme. This is actually what is doing the carrying of the oxygen in the bloodstream, but it circulates in this form of the hemoglobin molecule in the blood. This is the heme molecule itself, and you're going to see this many times. Um, it's ring-shaped, and it contains iron, and the iron is important because it can bind oxygen. So here it is binding oxygen, and that's how it carries it through the bloodstream. How is heme made? Well, heme is synthesized 80% in the bone marrow, daily synthesis of blood of red blood cells, that's all the time, and 20% in the liver for purposes of detoxification. And that responds to changing metabolic needs of the body. There are eight enzymes that form the heme molecule. And each of them, like a factory, here's my little factory down here, convert a substrate into the next step in the heme synthesis pathway. When an enzyme doesn't function correctly, the substrate of the affected enzyme accumulates, meaning the, 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 uh, the thing that was being fed into the enzyme accumulates uh, when the enzyme can't convert it to the next step. The properties of the accumulated substrate and where it accumulates determine the symptoms of the porphyria. We're gonna come back to my little factory in a minute. So this is the incredibly complicated heme biosynthesis pathway. And I'm a very visual person, so I, I need to see things and have a, a visual place to start. So I'm not gonna go through all this, but for me, it's very helpful to see that each enzyme in this pathway um, causes a particular, or can be, can a mutation in that enzyme can cause a particular porphyria. So for example, 
Um, the heme pathway starts here. I said start. Glycine plus succinyl CoA is where we start. And then the um, mutation in this particular gene here is what causes X linked protoporphyria. And we're going to talk about that today. And then we have these different porphyrias as we go along until we get all the way to here. The very last step before the heme molecule is done uh, is, is a is a enzyme called ferrochelatase or FECH. And a mutation in this is what causes erythropoietic protoporphyria. So <clears throat> seven of the eight porphyrias, so we have eight porphyrias here, they're all in yellow, um, are caused by gene mutation. And actually the exception to this, which I won't go into in detail, is porphyria cutanea tarda, which is actually caused by an acquired inhibitor, which reduces the enzyme activity. Um, some people do have a genetic defect um, as a predisposing factor, but it's it's more of an acquired problem with the enzyme rather than a gene mutation, as opposed to the other porphyrias. So there are four hepatic porphyrias, um, and these are primarily uh, liver related. Um, they have acute on uh, acute symptoms, um, often with uh, neurological symptoms, uh, incredible visceral pain. And I've circled them here. And again, we're not going to talk about them. There's two of these that do have cutaneous symptoms, and that is uh, variegate porphyria uh, greater than hereditary coproporphyria. Um, so these are um, considered to be hepatic porphyrias, but they also do have blistering um, rashes as well. There are three blistering cutaneous porphyrias. Those are uh, congenital erythropoietic porphyria. Again, we're not going to talk about it today. Um, this is porphyria cutanea tarda. We talked about a little bit already. Um, HCP, the hereditary coproporphyria, um, and then a little bit variegate porphyria. And these are the blistering cutaneous porphyrias. And then last, we get into this here, which is the two non-blistering acute cutaneous porphyrias. And that's where I'm going to spend time talking today. And these are EPP, as we've talked about, and XLP. Um, and their mutations in these two enzymes here, FECH and ALAS2. Okay, so I'll start with a little bit of an introduction um, to EPP. Um, it's a rare genetically inherited condition. Its prevalence is about one to 140,000. That's a conservative estimate. Males and females are equally affected. Um, and actually it was interesting. It was, it was first documented in 1926. And then it was first identified as EPP in 1961. And I think this is cool. This is the original article, uh, a, new port a new porphyria syndrome, um, erythropoietic porphyria in 1961. So what is the genetic cause of EPP? As we already mentioned, it's mutation in ferrochelatase, the last step in the heme synthesis pathway. What does the FECH enzyme do? It converts protoporphyrin 9 into heme by inserting iron. And in EPP, residual, or what's left, FECH activity is typically around 35% of normal. FECH deficiency results in accumulation of protoporphyrin 9. So here we are, and again, I'm very visual. So here we are, uh, here's the enzyme, and we're crossing out ferrochelatase. And you can imagine if you cannot convert ferrochelatase to heme, you are going to accumulate protoporphyrin 9. And in my little factory example, um, here are all the workers and they're getting boxes and they're doing different things with the boxes and then they're and then they're passing them along. And in in the in this particular example, the the worker here is 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 deficient. <laughs> they're not able to keep up um, with the uh, with the business of of the factory. And so because of that, the boxes accumulate behind them. And that's how you get the accumulation of protoporphyrin nine. It's interesting, uh, sorry, so we'll we'll, We'll move on to the slide here. So how do we test for EPP? Uh, and I mean this specifically for EPP, not XLP. So the enzyme FECH also adds zinc to the small amount of protoporphyrin that normally remains after heme synthesis. So when there's low FECH activity, we see accumulation of protoporphyrin produ produced by bone marrow reticulocytes that lack iron or other metals, particularly zinc. So this is called metal-free protoporphyrin. This is a unique feature of EPP um, because the FECH is not adding the zinc. Um, and so as a result, you're getting that metal 
free protoporphyrin. And in EPP, greater than 85% of the total erythrocyte protoporphyrin is metal free and less than 15% is zinc protoporphyrin. And this matters and I'll talk about why in just a moment. Now, let's talk about X-linked protoporphyrin or XLP. Sometimes you'll see it XLPP. EPP and XLP have identical clinical features, but they're caused by different gene mutations. If you clinic, if you um, test uh, um, patients that come in with symptoms of EPP, you're going to find that about 10% of these protoporphyria patients have XLP on molecular testing. And XLP is a very different type of uh, defect in the in the in the heme synthesis pathway. Although again, it results in the same clinical scenario. It's actually a gain of function mutation in ALAS2, which is the first step in the heme synthesis pathway. It's very different. Too much protoporphyrin is made in the bone marrow. And so it's making so much protoporphyrin that it overwhelms the FECH enzyme at the end of the pathway. And then you get that accumulation of the protoporphyrin 9. So here you're just sending so much protoporphyrin through the pathway that then it overwhelms this enzyme and you get an elevation in protoporphyrin 9. Again, the same, um, the same uh, clinical scenario. In my little factory example here, you're, um, you're sending so many boxes through the, uh, through the factory that the um, factory worker who's in charge of FECH, <laughs> this, or sorry, in charge of uh, ferrochelatase step can't keep up. And so that's why you get the accumulation of boxes. So it's a, it's a different um, mechanism, but it creates the same issue. So um, this is how we can test um, on the lab in the laboratory for XLP, for X-linked protoporphyria. The FECH is functional, so it's still able to add zinc to make zinc protoporphyrin. So in XLP, you're going to see that zinc protoporphyrin makes up a greater proportion of the excess protoporphyrin than an EPP. But still, the metal-free protoporphyrin still predominates because you're exceeding the FECH capacity so much. So in contrast to EPP, only 15 to 50% of erythrocyte protoporphyrin is zinc protoporphyrin. Um, this is an algorithm, um, and Nicole, I don't know if these slides will be published or available, but I, I think it's nice for, for, for people to have access to a, a diagnostic algorithm, algorithm which starts with um, uh, looking, you have to test the total erythrocyte porphyrins, and you find that they're increased to about often three times normal. And when you break these down, these erythrocyte um, porphyrins, you see that they're mostly metal-free protoporphyrin. And then you look at the proportion of the zinc protoporphyrin to distinguish EPP versus XLP. And then, of course, you can also do gene sequencing, which would be the FECH gene or the ALAS2 gene. Um, these tests are very specialized, and these are typically um, send out labs, this is in the United States, to Mayo or to UTMB. Um, and uh, these have these, the laboratories that primarily uh, perform these tests. Um, so even though we have a great lab at my hospital in Boston, these are still send out tests to, to these, um, these two particular uh, labs in the country um, who really do this very well. So EPP genetics. Um, EPP is autosomal recessive. What that means is that you need mutations on both copies of the FECH gene. You get two copies of each gene, one from your mother and one from your father. And in an autosomal recessive disorder, you need mutations on both copies of the gene, one from the mother and one from the father. But about 95% of people with EPP have one severe loss of function variant, that's a severe variant in one of the genes, and a common low expression variant on the other. So very different in terms of what the gene mutation is usually between the uh, two chromosomes that you have if you have EPP. Um, the low expression gene contributes to decreased FECH activity but interestingly, two copies of that FECH low expression variant do not result in EPP. And actually in some groups, it's very widely prevalent. It's present in 10% of the, of the population um, in some white European and Asian groups. And when I say this, I think it was a French study that was done that was establishing the, uh, the white European group. So again, I think it really depends on where in the world you are um, in terms of what the genetic variants um, look like and therefore what your risk is of um, of, of getting EPP. 
XLP is different. It's a recessive X-linked gene. So remember, that means it's going on the X chromosome. In males, there is males get an X from the mother and a Y from the father. Uh, and uh, females get one X from the mother, one X from the father. But in males, there is no backup second copy since they only have one X chromosome. So XLP is more commonly seen in males. But girls can be uh, just as affected, actually, by XLP um, if the backup copy on the other X chromosome is turned off due to a process called lionization, which is basically that um, for any gene uh, on the X chromosome for, for, for girls, usually have one that's predominating over the other on the other chromosome. So even though this is XLP is more commonly seen in males, girls can still be just as affected by XLP, depending on how their, um, how their uh, uh, gene expression um, um, has, has come out. And I, I put this in just in case there were questions, but I'm going to skip it and we're going to move on. Um, okay, so what does the accumulation of protoporphyrin 9 do? How does it cause symptoms? And I just wanted to start off because I think this is just amazing to, to show you these two structures. Now, we already looked at the structure for porphyrin, right? We, we saw it. It looks like this. This is the iron. It's going to bind to the oxygen. Look at this molecule. This is chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is found in plants. I am no molecular biologist or botanist or anything, but they look very similar to me. And so, and they are very similar. And chlorophyll actually um, uh, um, uh, has a relationship with light in plants that allows them to grow by attracting light and porphyrin is exactly the same. So protoporphyrin 9, just like chlorophyll, absorbs visible light. Um, and it does this, especially in the blue-violet range, which has a name called the SORET band. Um, so I'm just going to show this over here. This is a, an electronic absorption spectrum of a typical porphyrin showing a peak at 4 400 to 410 nanometers. And here it is. And you can see this here. This is our wavelength of nanometers. And I'm about to show a lot of these pictures. So it's worth familiarizing yourself. This is the absorbance of the light. And then this is the wavelength going up in nanometers. And here we are at... 400 to 410, which is our SORET band. Now, this is in the blue-violet range, but you can also see there are a couple little bumps um, as we go further out into the visible range, and I'll show that in just a minute. So what does this mean? So when the protoporphyrin 9 absorbs visible light, it excites an orbital electron, which reacts with oxygen, and this generates reactive oxygen species, which are bad. Reactive oxygen species can lead to damage to the cells of the blood vessel wall called the endothelium. And this is thought to be the main target of damage in um, EPP slash XLP. Um, so in addition, reactive oxygen species can lead to immune activation through something called complement, leaky blood vessels, allergic type reaction. I'm sorry, I have a typo here that should say mast cells, uh, scar formation, fibroblasts, and the reaction is generally proportional to the duration of the light exposure. So this brings us to why we have symptoms, sunlight-induced symptoms with EPP and XLP. Um, so what are the symptoms? EPP typically presents in childhood, and generally it's constant throughout life. Even brief seconds to minutes exposure to sunlight can cause a flare. And for some, depending on the severity of the issue, even indoor light can cause a flare. There is typically a prodrome with itching and tingling first, and then this leads to severe burning pain. And actually, it may occur that uh, it may actually occur following a longer exposure the prior day uh, called the priming phenomenon. What I mean by that is let's say that on Monday you're out for 15 minutes and yes, you have some reaction. Well, on Tuesday, you might go out for five minutes and you have a and you have a severe reaction. You've been primed by your exposure the previous day. If you have exposure past point of no return, there can be incapacitating pain that lasts for days to weeks, unresponsive to treatment, including including opioids. You can't sleep, you can't think, and it's just and it's just very awful. A lot of people learn how to recognize that prodrome and get out of the sun as quickly as possible. And what is um, so difficult about this is that often the skin looks normal during a flare. Now, you can see swelling, and that's present in about 60 to 80% of people. And you can see broken blood vessels called petechiae. Um, oops, I'm sorry. 
Um, so here we see um, someone's hands. You can see that they're very swollen. We call that edema or swelling. And then you can see these broken blood vessels called petechiae, but you don't have to. And someone can be, and their skin can look absolutely stone cold normal. And they are having intensely severe pain because they're experiencing a terrible flare. Um, the hands, the feet, and the, and the face are the most sensitive. But there's a lot of other symptoms that can go along with this as well. You can have aching, fatigue, you can have itch, and even painful touch called allodynia, where a slight touch or scratch can be intensely painful. Just some more, um, some more pictures here. Um, uh, edema, swelling, uh, redness or erythema, um, vesicles, uh, bullous lesions, uncommonly. And then some scarring in the sun-exposed areas, um, and that's typically a, a chronic skin change which um, would be what I would call thickening or lichenification of the skin. And here it's over the, the dorsal aspect of the hands. Um, many people with EPP learn how to manage this so well that you don't see these chronic skin changes because they become incredibly sun avoided and they just figure out exactly how many minutes they need to spend outside before they have to get inside. Otherwise they're gonna be in the middle of a severe flare. So honestly, I haven't seen very many people with chronic skin changes from EPP. This has a huge impact on quality of life. Um, uh, there is uh, often an extreme risk aversion to light exposure that begins in uh, early childhood. Kids just say they have to get out of the sun. Um, I read that there was a long time, a median of nine years from the initial presentation to diagnosis. And that's because um, many uh, uh, doctors um, uh, have not heard of this and they don't know what to order. Um, Family and friends and schools often cannot understand the magnitude of suffering of someone undergoing a flare. Um, and, and a quote I, I heard was, people are not very sympathetic about invisible pain to light. Um, uh, people are often uh, unable to participate in outdoor activities. They're always planning. They're counting the minutes. How long is it going to take me to get to the store? What am I going to wear on my hands when I'm driving to the store? Um, and, they're, and they're planning their lives around sun exposure. And this is true even inside. Uh, fluorescent um, lights and operating room lights can be an issue. And then also windows are not protective. They let through UVA and visible light. And I put a plug here for the um, International Window Film Association, um, which is a, uh, um, a, a great resource for people looking into um, window tints uh, for both car and for home um, uh, who are interested in, in, in learning more. Um, okay. So why doesn't sunscreen help protect people with EPP from the sun? Sunscreen should help, right? It helps protect you from the sun, not for people with EPP. And this is why. So let's look back at our SORET band. And here the peak again is 410 nanometers. And I would say that it's extending from, you know, maybe around 370, 380 here up to like 420 nanometers. Now, this is this is something that I look at all the time, but this is this is the this is the UV spec. This is the um the the, the light spectrum coming from all light, uh, all electromagnetic uh, wavelengths. Um, so here we are in this is the ultraviolet spectrum, right? We have UVC, then we have UVB, and we have UVA. This is where your sunscreen's all focused here: UVB and UVA. And I'll show that in just a second. And then here next to it, you have visible light, which is what allows us to see. And this is where we have problems um, with protoporphyrin. So here's that SORET band, peak 410, right? And here it is right at that um, violet blue portion of the visible spectrum with those little tiny bands, doop de doop de doop right here um, uh, at, at around 500, 550, 600, uh, 650, um, going through the visible spectrum. But the biggest one is definitely in the blue light um, realm. Now, why doesn't sunscreen help? Well, these are the longest range chemical sunscreens on the market. And you can see here, so let's look, this is um, avobenzone and tizorb. If you're looking for um, a sunscreen and you're going to the, the store and you're gonna pick out a chemical sunscreen on the shelf at um, CVS Pharmacy, which is you know the pharmacy near me, um, you're gonna see avobenzone in that sunscreen. And you're gonna see avobenzone here, its absorbance drops right off, right around 390. So there is no protection here from chemical sunscreens um, into the longest UVA and definitely no coverage into visible light. 
Now, I have been to lectures and they have said, well, uh, people with um, porphyrias should wear mineral sunscreens, zinc and titanium. Let's look and see if that's good advice. So here is zinc and here is titanium and here is 390. And you can see that there is very little coverage from either of these. Um, and here's our SORET band way out here. So these are, these, are, these are not going to help. The same problem that we have with the chemical sunscreens, we have the mineral with the mineral sunscreens, they just don't protect even into the long range UVA. Now, sunscreen applied in what's called a light opaque manner, I call this the 70s sunscreen application, it does block visible light, but this is obviously often not cosmetically acceptable. So this actually would protect against visible light, but again, not cosmetically acceptable. Now, here's why I bring this up. Sunscreen or makeup with iron oxide, which is called tinted sunscreen, does absorb in the long range UV and visible spectrums. So here again, we are, here's titanium dioxide, here's zinc oxide, look at their dropping off in their absorbance right around 390, right? What is yellow iron oxide doing? Here's yellow iron oxide, and you can see, still, you can see it's still protecting all the way through the, the end of the UV spectrum, and then also into visible light. So tinted sunscreen or makeup with iron oxide does absorb in the long range UV and visible spectrum. What else? Well, fabrics protect from visible light as well. So um, I always love this photo protection by different fabrics. We talk all the time about sunscreens, but look, fabrics protect across all uh, wavelengths of light. All right, so let's move on. And now let's talk um, about uh, systemic um, uh, manifestation, man manifestations of EPP. And again, I mean EPP and XLP. And we'll start off by talking about effects on the liver, since this is very important. And this is the thing that we worry about most. So first, um, uh, one thing that we can see um, is gallstones. And that is fairly common. It's from excretion of protoporphyrin into the bile. Protoporphyrin is, um, uh, it, it must be excreted into the bile. That's the only way uh, for it to get out of the body. Um, but unfortunately, um, it can cause uh, crystals and, and blockage, um, and it can cause gallstones. And, and the percentage of gallstones is a little unclear. I've seen eight, I've seen 20%, but, but it's high um, as we go along. And if there is gallstones that we see in a child, um, we should be thinking about, um, about a porphyria. Um, now let's talk about protoporphyric proto hepatopathy. This is the most serious complication and the thing that we absolutely worry about the most. It occurs in about two to 5% of, of patients. And it, it happens because protoporphyrin is toxic to the liver. So there's a vicious cycle. Protoporphyrin builds up in the liver and then it damages it. So then the liver can excrete even less protoporphyrin and then we get further buildup and we get more damage to the liver and then it can excrete even less protoporphyrin. So this vicious cycle can precipitate, um, uh, can, can, can build um, and it becomes very, very difficult to break it. Um, uh, uh, protoporphyrin hepatopathy can be set off or precipitated by another cause of liver dysfunction like excess alcohol or viral hepatitis or fatty liver, which, which can um, start this process by impairing protoporphyrin excretion to begin with. And this is why we talk so much about um, what I call healthy liver practices um, in, in folks with um, EPP. Um, so how will you identify protoporphyric hepatopathy um, it's hard. You may start seeing increased photosensitivity. You may see high or rising porphyrin levels, and you may not see abnormal liver function tests until it's too late or until it's late, I guess, or I shouldn't say too late, but until it's late in the game. Um, and these patients can ultimately require liver transplant. But remember that liver transplant does not cure EPP. Um, they may still need bone marrow transplant since the problem is really the bone marrow. What are the other systemic complications of EPP? Um, uh, vitamin, vitamin D deficiency and osteoporosis. Um, this is due to sun avoidance, not due to anything regarding the EPP itself, but definitely due to sun avoidance. Up to 46% of patients in one study, and we do recommend vitamin D supplementation. And then what about anemia? Uh, this is a tricky one, um, often seen in EPP and XLP. Uh, one study showed 37% of patients have anemia, but generally this is not that clinically significant. And it's really unclear um, what's driving this. If it's the excess, if the excess protoporphyrin is actually down-regulating iron absorption, or whether this just represents redistribution of iron stores. And then also, very rarely you can see peripheral neuropathy um, in someone with a very severe 
um, presentation of, of EPP and, and particularly usually with a, with a liver issue, uh, severe liver issues as well. So how do we manage um, patients with EPP? Well, first we counsel regarding limiting light exposure as I've just talked about. Um, what else do we do? We, we minimize risk to the liver. We talk about um, re, uh, minimizing alcohol, uh, reducing risk for fatty liver, exercising, maintaining a healthy weight. We talk about minimizing risk to, hepat of, to hepatitis, viral hepatitis. We vaccinate against hepatitis A and B. And we, we um, educate patients about minimizing the risk of hepatitis C, which is a virus that does not have a vaccine, um, which is typically um, spread through um, IV drug use or through um, uh, sexual transmission. Um, we do get at least yearly labs um, uh, for patients. And I say at least yearly because um, we would get yearly if there was nothing going on, there was no issues that were being identified um, and more than yearly if we were finding something that needed to be followed more closely. And what are those that we get? Um, a CBC, which is looking at the bone marrow function, the liver chemistries, um, iron studies, um, oops, sorry, the, uh, um, the vitamin D level, which is the 25 hydroxy vitamin D level, and then also we get that erythrocyte total and metal free protoporphyrin and plasma porphyrin levels, and then liver imaging as indicated, um, if indicated. Um, we talk about treatment. There is, we're going to talk about in just a second, there is a one FDA approved treatment for, um, for EPP. Um, in, the, in the United States, the FDA is the um, uh, the, the body that regulates um, uh, drug approval, me drug medication approval. And so that is athamelanotide or, or senest. Um, and then we can talk about clinical trials as well. Um, a multidisciplinary team is ideal if possible. And the reason I say if possible is because it really depends on where you are in the United States, in the world, um, in terms of what specialists are available to you. And often it is primary care doctors who are managing um, EPP. If it is possible, it's great to have access to hematology, dermatology, hepatology, and genetics, and then sometimes neurology um, if needed. And I, you know, I, I absolutely rely on the other members of, of my team um, all the time. So let's talk about um, aflamelanotide or SNES. Um, it is, as I said, the only um, FDA approved medication for treatment of, of EPP. Um, what is it? It's an analog of endogenous alpha-melanotide stimulating hormone or alpha-MSH. It's an implant. So it literally looks like this. It looks like a little clear stick straw and it, it's stuck as an implant um, uh, underneath the skin and that is administered every eight weeks. Um, it, was, it was FDA approved in, um, in, in 2019. So, you know, maybe three and a half years ago at this point. And what does it do? It increases eumelanin. So melanin, eumelanin is what we all think of as protective pigmentation. Um, it reduces UVB penetration into the skin, um, but it does. But it's more than just pigmentation. It also does some other things as well. It scavenges or looks for oxygen radicals, so it acts as an antioxidant. And then um, alpha MSH also inhibits production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it, it's a little bit unclear exactly all the ways in which this medication works, but it's it's more than just the creation of, of pigment. Um, it has these other antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, and the studies, there were studies, there was a study done in the US and there's a study done in the EU. Um, and both of them were published in a seminal paper in the New England Journal of Medicine um, a couple of years, in two, I think it was 2019. Um, what they saw in the U.S. study was a 70% improvement in duration of pain-free time after six months, um, and then in the e EU, um, it was a duration, it was a, um, a decreased duration of pain-free time in sunlight, six hours versus 0.8 hours in the placebo group. And they measured these endpoints slightly differently, but you can see that there was a definite um, uh, increase in pain-free time in the sunlight that you were able to spend when you're on this medication. They also found fewer phototoxic reactions when on the medication, and very importantly, the recovery time was significantly faster. And these patients have a significant improvement in quality of life. Um, in terms of adverse reactions, um, very little. It's generally pretty well tolerated. Um, so um, the, the biggest one is implant site reactions. 
Um, we can have some nausea or some fatigue um, associated with the implant itself that usually fades after a week or so, sometimes two weeks. Um, and then the other thing that we talk about a lot is skin hyperpigmentation um, uh, or, or, um, and skin irritation at the injection site, but really very well tolerated, very few side effects um, and, and really no, no big ones. Um, knock on wood that have we that we've seen. And this um, and again, these um, there has not been anything new that's been seen um, in the uh, post FDA approval data, which is great. So it continues to have an excellent safety pro profile. What are some of the issues? Um, uh, every eight weeks, which is how often that you're allowed to administer this medication, that's for its approval is is often not quite soon enough. So often I find that people are um, beginning to flare again. Um, around even six and a half or seven weeks. If I could give it every seven weeks, I think everyone would be um, really, really happy. Um, it's it's very, very costly. Uh, and as a result, insurance approval is, is quite difficult and it takes a long time to get insurance approval. I find it usually takes around eight weeks in the US to get insurance approval. And then accessibility is an issue. Um, it's implanted every eight months by, uh, sorry, eight months, goodness, every eight weeks, please don't look at that, every eight weeks um, by a trained uh, trained provider. Um, and so um, if you are not in a part of the country which has a trained provider, which is easily accessible to you, um, very challenging to find someone. And I know that the company is working on getting uh, more and more uh, accessibility for the medication, which is, which is great. Um, and then the other thing is that it doesn't reduce risk of liver disease or other issues um, from cordoporphrin itself. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's treating the symptoms, but it is not... Um, uh, but it is not modulating the heme synthesis pathway itself. Um, that being said, um, this medication is absolutely life-changing uh, for the people that it works for. And, and it has been my, my great pleasure to, um, to get to know um, some of the patients that, that are doing well on it and how, how amazing it has been for them. So that's been, that's been really cool to be, to be able to offer something, whereas before we were not. Um, but then there are other things that are under study. So one of these is bitopertin, um, which is which is very exciting. Uh, it's an oral medication that was originally for schizophrenia. As far as I understand, it was not very helpful for schizophrenia, um, but they found that it actually may modulate heme biosynthesis by inhibiting the glycine transporter, limiting glycine uptake, which if you remember was at the very, very beginning of our heme synthesis cycle. And actually preliminary data shows significant increase in sunlight challenge time, which is great, and a decrease in protoporphyrin 9. Um, it's oral. Um, and, uh, and also it would not only help with symptoms of sunlight, but also could modulate, um, uh, the, um, problems from having, uh, protoporphyrin buildup. So it could, again, this is all could, because this is not, uh, approved It's still in the clinical trial phase, but, um, but it could actually, um, affect, uh, you know, risk to the liver, which would be fantastic. Um, there's there's two other medications which are um, currently under active study. One of those is cimetidine. Um, it has been helpful in other porphyrias, and it is currently under study with, you know, has had some mixed results in EPP and XLP. But again, um, you know, uh, under under study, and there's uh, active clinical trial going on with that now. And the other one is dersimelagon, which is very similar to um, uh, the um, Sines. It's an but it's an oral version of alpha MSH and it's a daily medication. And that is in phase three clinical trials. So some things on the horizon. I think with that, I am done with what I prepared and actually I'm ready to move on to the questions. Um, and so I did get some, some great questions and they were, they were not easy questions. Um, and so I, I, I listed a couple of them here. I tried to group some of them that I thought were um, kind of similar and put them together. So I'll we'll start off by addressing those and then we can take any other questions that there are. So one is, is bone density something to be concerned about and how should it be monitored? And the answer is yes, this is concern if there is a history of vitamin D deficiency, which is why it's so important to be monitoring that vitamin D. Um, we do need to check that vitamin D level at least yearly. We need to supplement with vitamin D3. Um, and it is absolutely appropriate to screen for um, bone density in someone who has had uh, vitamin, D, uh, vitamin D deficiency or may have other risk factors um, that could contribute to osteoporosis. So absolutely, yes. And I would totally bring that to the primary care doctor um, as, as something to do. Um, I loved this question. A cure for sickle cell anemia utilizing CRISPR has been approved recently. Could you see something like this being used to treat EPP and other blood disorders in the future? 
And I thought this was fantastic. Yes, absolutely. How amazing would that be? CRISPR is a brand new tool. Actually, it's not super brand new. It's um, I think it came around again until like 2019, but it's but it's being used and discovered more and more in terms of what it can do. And it allows for gene editing. Uh, I've heard it described as molecular scissors, where you can literally correct a gene um, uh, through this molecular editing technique through RNA. So that would be absolutely amazing. I mean, there are so many genetic diseases um, that I would love to see this applied to. That would truly um, revolutionize uh, this. Um, all of these um, porphyrias would be absolutely amazing. So I, I love that question. And I hope somebody's working on that. That'd be great. Um, okay, should EPP patients, these were some liver, liver questions here. Should EPP patients avoid over-the-counter medications that are metabolized by the liver, such as acetaminophen? Is there a list available anywhere of over-the-counter meds that would generally be considered safe? So um, I would say no. Um, what we usually do is general liver protection strategies. Again, diet, low alcohol intake, all of those things that we talked about before. But I have never seen anyone recommend any medications to avoid preventatively, and that's unlike the hepatic porphyrias. But I would also add that if there is someone who has active liver disease or damage that's going on, then this would absolutely change. So I think that I would answer this question as no in someone who has had no issues with their liver. Um, uh, but I would answer it quite differently um, if, if, there, if there was an active issue that was going on. Um, if you're regularly having your blood work checked about once a year, should you have a routine ultrasound of your liver to check for damage? So again, I would say this depends on your particular situation. We typically do not do routine ultrasounds if there's no history of liver abnormality or increasing porphyrins, there's no risk to the liver. Um, so no risk factors at all. I, I have not seen uh, routine liver ultrasounds done, um, but I have a very low threshold to refer to hepatology um, because again, this is the thing that we cannot miss, should not miss, um, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, keeps me up at night about EPP. So low threshold to refer to hepatology for any concerns about, about liver, liver related issues. Oh, this one was tricky. How can EPP patients best manage low iron levels? This I found hard. And actually, I, I, I think I have to say in the end that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best person to answer this. So I would have to ask a, ask an, another, another expert. Um, but I would say, uh, uh, I would say to start off by answering this question, it depends on the clinical situation. Is there also anemia in addition to low iron? And then is the anemia clinically significant? Remembering that a lot of these patients, a lot of patients with EPP and FSLP have anemia, but it doesn't seem to be clinically significant. So, um, and, and the reason that this is tricky is that it's, is that it's discussed whether iron could be harmful or helpful. So it's thought, okay, so it may upregulate protoporphyrin production, which could be potentially harmful, or it could increase FECH stability, which could be potentially helpful. Um, and this is why I found it very difficult to answer this question. And in, in EPP, reports have suggested that iron may actually increase protoporphyrin and light sensitivity, but this seems to be transient, whereas an XLP iron supplementation may be beneficial. So again, that's a hard one, and I think it depends on your, on your particular situation. And that is all I had. So I'm going to just move on to that slide and then I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll be able to see all of your faces again, which will be nice. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> well, thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. I learned so I learned more than I've ever learned about EPP. I loved your your factory and the plant analogy. It made so much sense. I was like, wow, I, I had no idea. That was really great. And I think you touched on something that's really important about how people are, people in schools and family are not as sympathetic to this pain from, invis, you know, this invisible pain, you know, from light. So it's, it's, we, we talk to patients every day and um, with all types of porphyry, but especially cutaneous like EPP and XLP, it is just, it's just so hard. It's, it's, it's so hard to live with it in the first place and then to deal with all that. So thanks for, for bringing that up. It's so important. There's another, there's, does anyone have any questions they want to put in the chat for Dr. Bosney? I think we've got a couple more minutes that she can answer a couple more. Now there's one in here that says, why does Clinival only allow dermatologists to give SNES rather than also allowing porphyry doctors to give it? I feel that, um, I don't know 
but I think that other doctors do are able to give it. So I don't think it's just dermatologists, but I, that I would defer to you. I, I know that there are other doctors that, that do give it who are not, who are not just dermatologists. And I think that it, um, just, you know, I, I don't know how folks are chosen often. It's there are. Who, yes. Yes. Okay. Good. There are. Right, great. Sorry, Desiree. Yes. There are other, there are hematologists. Um, and other doctors, so. Thank you. Right. And then let's see. Oh, someone asked if the slide shall be emailed. We are going to, we are recording. So we will, we will, rec we'll send out the link for the recording so you can have the slideshow. Let's see. Dr. Bosni, I'll let you pick, pick which ones that you. Oh, I should be if you can you see it? I, I can read them. Oh, to yes, you. sorry, I wasn't I wasn't looking. Oh no, no, her. that's okay. Is there an alternative to Sinness? Well, I mean, I think this this gets to what I was talking about with these up and coming treatments, and um, you know, again, I think I feel like Sinness just revolutionized this this world back in 2019, but we still have so far to go in terms of how many questions we have about um, porphyrias, and then also um, and also treating. So again, I, I have great hopes for um, the, uh, the the strategies that are currently in, in, cl in clinical trials now. But no, there is no FDA approved alternative to SNS right now. Um, blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh, what is the most effective pain relief drug in your experience? Mm, you're asking the wrong person. I'm so sorry. I do not I do not prescribe um, opioids, and so I don't know. I, I I just I wouldn't even start to hazard a guess on that one. So I apologize. Um, as a VP patient, oh goodness. All right. Seeing a second opinion urgently. Yes. That sounds, that sounds terrible. And absolutely. It sounds like you, you should be evaluated. I hope that there's some place that you can go to, um, with a, maybe a porphyria center in your, in your area. Um, yeah. Anra, you can, if you want to contact the APF, we can definitely help get you to get, uh, you know, recommend a doctor and stuff. And, uh, you can, uh, just look on our website. You can email us at general porphyriafoundation.org or just give us a call. Oh, I just want to comment on, I'm sorry. I, I just got to the very end of uh, Anne Rose Schutz, um comment as a VP patient. I was initially told by a doctor that sunlight wouldn't affect me. Um, that is, that is not the case. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you were, that you were told that yes, it is more rare than the other cutaneous porphyrias, but it absolutely can. And so I, I think, you know, again, second, seeking a second opinion sounds um, very, very important. So again, I, I, you know, there's so much misinformation about porphyrias um, and, and a lot of people just don't know, know a whole lot. And it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, thanks all. I really appreciate these questions and, and nice comments in the chat too. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so uh, much, Dr. Bosney. This, this was just absolutely wonderful. And I know that we all appreciate um, your time for presenting this. It was just I don't know about everybody else. We're getting a lot of great, uh, great people, great uh, comments here. I wanted to just go over a couple. I, I, the APF, we we get a lot of questions about SNS because it's the only EP, the only FDA approved drug. Um, and I just wanted to go over a couple questions that we also got for for this um, for this uh, this Zoom today. So. Um, a lot of people have asked, how how do I start? How do I start to get Sinesse? And you, if you go to Sinesse.com, you can um, you can register and you get an ID and then you can get a bunch of information. You can um, follow the instructions for that. They do have, um, they've already done about over 16,000 doses, I think have been administered. And there is over 20 years of safety uh, 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 data on that. It's very safe and, um, also, we've gotten some questions about financial assistance. As you said, it's very expensive and what insurances cover it. And since porphyria EPP is a rare disease, um, this is, uh, SNES is considered a specialty medication. So if you can just check with your insurance company, if it's in your formulary, that like that that helps a lot. And um, and Clinval actually does provide um, uh, payment is like uh, financial assistance with out-of-cost pockets um, and uh, out-of-cost my good out of pocket costs, if I could speak today. And then also um, the APF has a program um, 
Uh, it's EPP testing assistance. So if you have any any problems with getting tested or anything like that, we have assistance with that as well. So the uh, one the last question was, how do I find uh, the closest EPP center? Again, if you go on to sines.com and register, you can see all the centers that would be nearest to you. So that was, I just wanted to go over those last few questions there. And, um, oh, thank you, Mariana. That's great. All right. So, um, Again, thank you so much, Dr. Busney. This was absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'll, I'll get off then, I guess. Um, <laughs> Nicole, thank you very much. And thanks for allowing me to be here today. I appreciate oh. it. And I appreciate all these wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye. All right. We're going to we're gonna move on to hearing from some patients. And I would love to start off with um, George. Uh, he has EPP and uh, George, if you want to just unmute yourself and just let us, if you want to share your experience with EPP, um, I know that uh, you've got quite a story. So we're looking forward to hearing about it. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is George Hodder and I do have EPP. I'm 54 years old, and currently live in an area between Northeast and Central Pennsylvania. I grew up in the Pittsburgh suburbs and I moved out to where I am now around 2007 for a job. I am the second of four kids in my family and three of us ended up having EPP. My older sister was the first to present with symptoms in early grade school. She and we used to call it the itchies as kids. And my parents knew like all other parents with uh, porphyria had pretty much no idea what it, what it was. Around second or third grade, when I started noticing my own symptoms, my parents initially thought I was just copying my sister and or thought we, couldn't, we just couldn't handle sunburn. Back then, there really wasn't any sun protective clothes and nobody wore anything like that anyways. Through the years, my mom tried to get us medical help, but we would typically be told to try sunscreen or um, some even suggested having psychological screenings. When our younger brother, the youngest of the four of us and seven years younger than me, when he started complaining of symptoms, my mother pushed harder for help. She was able to get us a referral for a der dermatologist. And this was back in the HMO days of insurance when you couldn't just go to specialists. Our dermatologist was newer. And when we presented our sim symptoms, she, she suspected porphyria right away. She tested us by taking skin core samples and all three of us tested positive. We were so happy to finally have a name for the condition and some hope, and then heard next that there wasn't a cure. This was when I was about in eighth grade. We started treatment with beta carotene tablets, which we were all very excited about. However, the quantities we had to take and the minimal effectiveness quickly changed our minds. I had to take 10 to 12 capsules daily, and I found it easier to simply suffer through my condition and avoid outside activities than to explain to others why my skin had an orange hue and I still had to miss out on most activity anyways. Growing up with EPP is hard. In the beginning, you don't realize that the reaction you have from the sun is any different than anyone else. Then at some point it hits you that you are different. Nobody really understands, be it our parents, our friends, our friends' parents, doctors, coaches, teachers. It is a hard burden to carry and at least in my life, has caused a lot of social anxiety, isolation, and personal doubt in myself and my abilities. High school was very hard without being able to participate in many sports or the typical fun things that kids of that age do. I never really tried to explain my condition to anybody because so few ever understood or cared. As a man, it was hard because you're seen as weak, soft, or any other number of slurs from your peers when you can't do certain things like playing sports or helping with outdoor work and projects. In my mid twenties, I took up mountain biking as an activity. I found over the years that my legs took longer to get any reaction. So riding in shorts was usually okay. So long as the day was not too sunny and I kept my rides around an hour. I really enjoyed being able to be outdoors doing an activity but I was still very limited in how often I could ride each week and couldn't be out long when I did. I also learned of a company called Salambra and their clothing for sun sensitive individuals. I bought a few items and found them very effective. I would use them for times that I would have to socialize outdoors 
for jobs or for other activities where skipping out just wasn't an option. It was a glimmer of hope that maybe things would get better. Relationships were never easy either. The vast majority of women I met did not want a guy who had outdoor limitations. I had relationships end because of my inability to vacation here or there or go to picnics or parties outdoors. As this happened more and more often, my confidence in believing anything would ever work out for me dwindled. Right around the time that I believed I would forever be a bachelor, I met Tammy, who would become my wife. When we met, she was going through some bad situations and was very open with sharing that with me. This helped me feel comfortable to share the details of my condition early on as well. And to my surprise, she did not run away. She's a good egg. <laughs> Married since 2004, we now have two children that both have been tested and are negative, but do carry the gene, of course. Tammy has been a great support and has been very understanding of my limitations over the years. She has also been very understanding of my want and need to be outside as much as possible now in my new normal with treatment from Seness. I have always wanted to find a way to help the next generation of EPP patients. So when the Seness clinical trials were announced, I pursued becoming a part of it. In 2010, I participated in the phase two trials at Mount Sinai in New York City and was blessed to get the actual drug. It was such a great experience to work with doctors and others who understood EPP and wanted to help us. This was also the first time I ever met another person with EPP that I wasn't related to, and it was comforting to hear similar backstories time and time again. It was a three and a half hour, or three and a half hour drive for me to get to every appointment, but I was able to do it for the six month period of the trial, mostly due to the support of my parents who also lived three and a half hours from me. They would drive from Pittsburgh to our house and then take me to each implant appointment in New York City and then get me back home safely and continue home to Pittsburgh. I am so grateful for their help. It was very hard to try to go outside and test the drug, especially knowing, not knowing if I had it or a placebo. Late in the trial, I finally worked to push myself past my comfort zone and was amazed by the results. I could be outside pretty much without limitations, regardless of the intensity of the sun, and it was amazing. After the trial, I worked to help get the drug approved. The tr this treatment just had to be available for everyone with EPP. So I joined the committee put together by Desiree and the APF to accelerate its approval. I did what I could to help, having my family, friends, my kids write letters to Congress and the FDA on my behalf and also helped with other activities to assist in approval. I didn't think it would ever be approved, but I was so glad when it was in 2019. This year, 2024, I will be starting my fourth year of treatment with Seness, and it has been life-changing. In that time, I have kept up on outdoor chores, regardless of weather, and can even mow my lawn without a shirt. I'll save you guys all the, <laughs> the embarrassment of that. If it's hot enough, it's, it's great, though. I took my first vacation at the beach, where I could actually be on the beach like anyone else. I can drive any time of day in any direction without cowering in whatever shade I can find in the car. Seness is not foolproof. I still can have reactions, but when I do, I find they are a bit easier to bear and recovery is faster. So I typically keep a protective clothing around if I plan for longer endeavors outside. I got more seriously into cycling and ride my bike nearly four to six days a week totaling eight to 12 hours over that time, massively more than I could ever do pre senes This e April, I will be starting my fourth year in a mountain bike race series that includes 11 races across the states of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and Delaware. Over these years, I've advanced my riding skills and I am now racing at the highest amateur level available. I designed an APF jersey for racing and this will be my second year wearing it. I wear it proudly to spread awareness for all porphyrias and to thank those who helped me get to this point in my life. Pre-Seness, I used to do a race here or there for fun, but I was never competitive, typically finishing in the bottom third of the pack. But now that I can train as much as anyone else, I compete in a higher class and I do fairly well. 
I never believed there would be an effective treatment in my lifetime. And I'm happy to be blessed with my fourth year of Sines. And I live a life I never dreamed possible. Full disclosure, I have my next treatment tomorrow in Pittsburgh with Dr. Smith. There are so many people we working to make it better for all of us. I hope to continue to do what I can to support them. Over the years, I've realized EPP makes us strong, not weak. We are extremely resilient people. We face daily challenges unseen by all and come back for more. I believe EPP has also given us a strong sense of empathy for others. When you see a person that is a loner or excluded from situations, you understand that maybe it's due to something they can't control that others can't readily see, just like EPP. So tap into that empathy, kindness, and understanding, and be the light that person may need to have a better day. We need that so badly in today's world. Lastly, keep your hope alive. The relief that you think you may not ever, that may never be possible, could become a reality in your lifetime. So much has changed for the better in my life, thanks to the work of others. I encourage you to do your best, to do your part, to make an impact for the next generation for those with EPP. Thank you for this time tonight, Nicole and everybody, and thanks to all who helped me on my journey, and God bless. Oh my God, George. Um, that was wonderful. Thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing. That was just I mean, you really gave me a feeling and I'm sure everyone on the call of, of what it's like and, and most are patients, so you know. So thank you so much. And George, uh, thank you also for being on our member advisory board and and uh, always always lending a helping hand to the APF. We always appreciate it. And, and uh, you've taught me so much about EPP. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank um, you for giving me this opportunity. Try not to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I was too. It was not easy. <laughs> you did great. Thank you so much. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Carly and Kim. Carly has EPP and <clears throat> Kim is her mother and uh, she's her caregiver. And I am really looking forward to hearing from you guys. Um, let me see if you guys can, can you unmute yourselves? Hello, Kim and Carly. Welcome. Hi, can you hear us? <laughs> yes, we can. Trying First to not cry here. It's not <laughs> fair. It's <laughs> behind George. Come on now. That's not fair. <laughs> I know. Wow. Uh, I'm Carly, by the way, um, and I, I'm the mom. If you couldn't tell, I know we look like we're sisters, but <laughs> so um, we have a little checklist of things that we wanted to talk to you about, but they're not as going to be as well said as how George said his story. And you know, I don't know if they'll make you cry or not. But, <laughs> um, you know, we have a lot in common with George's story and then we have a few things that are a little bit different and oh, there's the and dog, there's the dog. you said might bark and so of course of course you <laughs> doesn't look cute yeah, she sounds like she's she's quiet cute. the whole time oh my gosh seriously oh. Callie Callie stop sorry um <laughs> so um our journey started uh when Carly was three and uh, we were at a t-ball game for her older sister. And we were sitting on a, uh, we were gonna have lunch. So we were sitting on a blanket at a park and normally the kids wouldn't take their shoes and socks off, off a lot. I just was kind of neurotic about that. I don't know, you know what that was about. Cause I was barefoot forever and ever as a kid. But so maybe Carly's feet hadn't been exposed out to the sun except for this first time. And um, she was a very quiet, is a very quiet um, daughter of mine. I'm the opposite. And um, she went crazy on that blanket. She was screaming. She said, mom, I don't remember that. I just remember I what remember you told it. me, but <laughs> I thought she had been bitten by a hundred bugs that I thought, okay, uh, you know, a swarm of X had gotten onto her or killer ants or something had gotten to her feet because she was screaming so loudly. So um, we ended up getting her out of that situation, not knowing what it was at all. 
Um, and eventually getting, well, not eventually, it was actually pretty soon because I'm pretty pushy about things. <laughs> we got to, um, to a doctor. Um, we actually got to a dermatologist and said, this was happening. We think it might have something to do with dermatology. We don't know. And Carly, do you remember explaining to her um, what your symptoms were or Honestly, do you remember I that remember time? Okay. Three. <laughs> so she was, so she, yeah. So that was, you know, she was young as well. Went to this dermatologist and it wasn't at our regular clinic. They didn't have room at our regular clinic. So they had us go, you know, it was only, you know, half an hour away. We didn't have the big journeys that George had, you know, which we would have taken if we had to, you know, but um, went to this woman and, and she saw what Carly had and she went out of the room because you must have had some, some redness at that point. Yeah. I don't know. It's all a blur right now. Right. But came back, she went in there and she brought this book and she brought it and she opened it up and she said, I studied this in college. I think she has EPP and this is what it is. I was like, what the? What? <laughs> I thought they were going to give me a tube of something and send me away and be done. What? It's genetic? What? We have to get tested? What, what, what? Like none of this had ever come up before. So our whole family went and got tested. And as it turned out, Carly and my husband, Mark, and my daughter, Allison, all tested, do you call it testing positive for EPP? They all had EPP, but you know, it can different be at levels. different levels. So Carly was up here, her, her, her husband, her, <laughs> her dad, Mark was in here and her sister, Allie was way down here. And um, they asked my, if my son and I should also get tested. I said, we've had no reactions to anything before. So back then they just didn't test you. They only tested those three. Carly was the only one that had symptoms that were causing major problems in her life. Um, and, you know, it's just amazing to us how things happen to have this dermatologist who studied it and it's so rare I mean that to me is one of the biggest things like wow things happen for a reason um I went online to try to get help and you were wearing the protective clothing from Salumbra we should have gotten a discount for how much we <laughs> bought from them the beautiful hats you know try to make it fun because she's a kid and you know you want to make it look like she wanted to wear them right <laughs> Um, and she could cover up the rest. You had gloves. Yeah, I had gloves. You all had the time. gloves all the time. Gardening gloves. Gardening or gloves. Orchard. Because they had, you know, pretty prints on them. We were trying as hard as we could to not have her stand out, right? As as a young person. And um, and then we went to a, an amusement park. You remember this episode. Yeah. And I thought, oh, if we rent uh what's it a called? cabana? A cabana. We'll rent a cabana next to the pool and we'll be covered. So it won't be an issue. She can just go from the cabana to the pool and then come right back to the cabana. And that didn't happen. No, I, um, I actually, since I was still so young, I wanted to be somewhat normal. And I didn't know, even though I knew about my condition, God, now I'm gonna cry. God, um, it's okay. I I saw my mom was talking with one of her friends, and they were laying out, and they were sticking out their feet. Oh, I can't even talk. Okay, it's okay, <laughs> it's okay. And they were like sunbathing, and I thought, well, why can't I do that? I can probably do that with my mom. So I did that, and she didn't notice. She was just chatting away with her friend, and. And then I started feeling like, okay, it, it started to hurt. So I went in the pool and then I went back and then I just kept going back and forth. And then my feet started swelling. And, um, and then I was like, okay, this isn't, this isn't good. I think I'm having a reaction again. Um, so I told you, and then 
And also at the time I, I didn't actually have my swim shoes. I don't know how I forgot to get those. Um, and so then we got swim shoes, but my feet were so swollen, I couldn't fit them. So then I was just in too much pain. And so my mom decided, okay, you know what, we're getting out of here. So she, she put me on her back and we ran out of there. And then we went to the emergency room and I basically was in there for a few days at least. And I had ice buckets of water and I was just laying on my side with having them in the water. And every time the temperature would slightly change, like if it was slightly a little warmer, it would feel like it was on fire. So I would have to each time have to get ice in there. And, and then after a while, I was like, okay, this isn't working. It, every time I go out, it feels like they're on fire and they're still swollen. So I just, we just planned to might as well, let's fix it ourselves. So we just, I decided to just take them out of the water and use just a spray bottle and just constantly have like a fan on them and also a spray bottle. And then they started to swell down and it all seemed to fix itself, but it, it was a lot of pain, <laughs> but, um, but that seemed to help. And it, it got better after that. And um, yeah, so that was like that whole time point in the amusement park situation. Not amusing, was it? Yes. <laughs> it's not amusing. Um, yeah, but, um, but then, I mean, you kept contact with the foundation and also we found out about the uh, Sines drug, but that was also later on, but we found out that they were doing trials and everything. And also my dad tried to go into the trials, but he didn't have a strong enough uh, reaction and everything like that. So they couldn't have him in there. Um, and I was too young, so they couldn't have me do it. Um, but then they finally, after that, they finally got it approved, which was good. But also during high school and everything, high school was good for the most part, but I still had to adjust and I had to make sure that I was protecting myself as much as I could, like in PE and everything. And I wanted to be in some sort of activity. So I tried to, I tried out for cheerleading and I covered up, I put like tights on and everything like that. And, um, and I was out there, I was practicing every day, every minute I could, I was in the shade most of the time. And, um, but then come tryouts the day before the tryouts, I actually had a reaction during training and, um, and then I had to leave. And then the next day I still had like a reaction on my, my legs. And so I was not doing all right. So I, I just decided, okay, fine. I'll next year, I'll try out again. I'll try and do it myself. And so then I, the next year I tried out and the day of tryouts, I got another reaction and it was on my face and I couldn't handle it. So I, I left, but then you contacted the coach <laughs> and said, Hey, like we, we were trying to have her try out, but every single time that she was about to try out, she got a reaction. Somehow she had it. And she was great. She, she was like, Oh, I remember her. I remember her trying out. She was trying so hard and she was practicing every single minute. So we can have her in there and we'll have her in varsity. And so they just, stuck me in and then also in varsity it's all at night so it helped a lot yeah and and then every day I was practicing 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 make sure I was on it for everything and uh, that helped out a lot and that seemed to help out and I was I made sure I was at least covered as much as I could I wore jackets and everything like that that they had and I made sure that I was practicing mostly in the shade um, and then after that, then, then the Sines injection came in and it was approved and in Australia, in Australia. <laughs> yeah, no, it was Australia first. <laughs> Great. Let's <do> Australia. <laughs> we're in California, by the way. Yeah, we're in California. So we were like, well, we'll probably not go there, but we'll probably try to. <laughs> then, um, then they said that it was going to be in like LA, yeah. right? Los Angeles, Southern yeah. California. We're in Northern California. Yeah. And 
but then they actually finally said that okay we can get it over here in, in Santa Clara which is right next to us and the dermatologist that I connected with she actually like learned it and she she was so invested and like tried to make sure that she knew like exactly what it was for and everything like that and she was really like intrigued by the condition and everything and she's been awesome she every time that I come in she's like oh yeah there's there was maybe another person that might be getting it too soon but you're really the first one that I've ever gotten it done and so uh she was great yeah so that's that's basically the main portion of it but um how, yeah. how did you like Sinus like changes between oh yeah not being on it and being on it honestly my reactions are in just immensely better I if I go out I can feel like uh, I can be out there for maybe 15 minutes and I can maybe feel like some kind of reaction and then it goes away in like five minutes when I come back in inside and everything it's it's like maybe five minutes maybe less and it just goes away if I don't think about it it'll just go away yeah and it never used to be like that it used to be like hours and hours sometimes a couple days that I would have that reaction still there so it's definitely helped it's, it's been life-changing. Yeah. Like now I, I can have flip-flops and stuff and it, it feels normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. The story. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> wow. Carly. Uh, well, first of all, Kim, being pushy, I think is sometimes what it takes, <laughs> right? To with, don't with, tell my husband that though. The I I'm we'll, pushy. It's a we'll keep it between us. No, but um, <laughs> my mom, I have a different type of porphyry, but my mom was relentless and kept going. So sometimes that's just what it takes. And I think we can probably all um connect with with that. And um, and I just keep thinking, what if you hadn't gone to that other dermatologist? It was just uh, someone said it was serendipitous and then it totally yeah, yeah. And um and uh just Carly, thank you for sharing like how everything changed and that it I, it sounds like it's made you um all that that persistence of trying out for cheerleading that just sounds like it really like you you've really got a lot of determination and persistence so I think like George said too sometimes I these for things, my mom <laughs> yeah. I think George had a lot of the same similarities because he knew what he wanted to do he wanted to be outside. Mm -hmm. Carly knew what she wanted to be. She wanted to be out there cheerleading. And you want that for someone, yeah. you know, even though maybe the world says, wait a minute, if she does this, this is going to happen. Don't do it. Right. But you're going to push for it. You really, really wanted it. You yeah. did it anyway. And that's a big thing. I know a lot of us porphyria patients, we, we don't feel well. We, we know that we're overdoing or something, but we, we want to feel normal and we do it anyway. So that, that was just, absolutely wonderful thank you so much both of you for sharing that was just oh thank you I <laughs> <laughs> know oh, I, you guys are I should not have put makeup on today I think <laughs> life changing um, Sinesse is life changing oh I'm so glad I'm so glad that you're able to feel more so do you are are you still in high school Carly are you in going to what are you doing no now? I'm I'm 26 now she's so. she's not under my care anymore by the way <laughs> She has moved out of the house and yeah, there, they, there you go. That's so. great. That's wonderful. I'm so glad that that was life-changing for you. Just, it's just, it's, it, your story is very inspiring. Thank you so much, both of you so much for, Nicole, for sharing with us. Yes, George. Nicole, if I could just add one thing for Carly yes. too. It's just, um, for me, I found that a lot of the pre-indications of reaction are really learned. And it's, and with Sines, I started to kind of, try to push past that to yeah. see how I would feel. And I, I found that I, I wouldn't have a reaction, but I mean, still to this day, three and a half, four years in, if it's a really hot day, like the hair on my arms will stand up and my mind will be telling me, get out, get out, get out. And I just try to take a breath, calm myself down and stay a bit and do it with caution, of course, because I, you know, I don't know your situation. But I found as I slowly pushed further and further that it really wasn't a reaction. It was just my learned response to certain types of heat and certain types of sun. So, you know, I'd give it a shot and see if maybe that's the case too, especially since they're going away so quickly when you go inside. Um, it was the first thing I thought of, and maybe that can help you get a little bit more out of it. 
Yeah, I have noticed that um, when I have a reaction, I I realize I'm like, oh, it's it might just be in my head that I'm feeling it. So because it's just that that extra response that you've had for years and years that you're like, oh my gosh, I know this feeling, it's coming. So then it just like, right. yeah. And then I'm like, okay, I won't think about it. I won't think about it. And then it just goes away. So maybe right. I, yeah, I just, I still cover up sometimes because I'm just so used to that. But I should, I'm trying to slowly like get into like t-shirts and stuff and just walk outside. <laughs> but yeah, that's definitely what I should try though. That's so interesting. Yeah, just a little bit. Cause I mean, I still get reactions if I really overdo it. But, totally. um, you know, I just would, I just tried one day and I'm like, yeah, this feels really bad. It was like 90 plus degrees and blazing <laughs> sun. And I just was like, you know what? I'm just going to try to push past it. And I was fine. And the more that I've done that, the less I get that like initial trigger um, that I need to get out because I'm usually okay. So, um, you know, okay. try it with caution and see if it works for you. I hope it does. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's a, that's a big thing that being one way for so many years in your life and then only having a couple years to get used to it. That's, that's definitely got to, you know, mess with your mind a little bit so um that's and like you even said if I just didn't think about it like if I don't think of I tried not to think about it and then I would get better so it's just it's 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 amazing so well George thanks that's that's awesome thank you guys every all of you for sharing um I would like to share since we've got so many people from all over the world today I also have a video from um Arturo, he's from Mexico. He has EPP and he made this video about how uh how he um how he a day in his life kind of so i'm going to share that with you guys if that's all right let me find it here and I invite you to get to know what a day in my life is like living with erythropoietic protoporphyria, EPP, and the challenges I face. Despite molecular evidence confirming that I have EPP combined with cystinuria, which causes me to excrete cysteine, the body's natural defense against ultraviolet rays. This disorder causes me a lot of abdominal pains as if a red hot iron were piercing through me, leaving a burning coal inside. This leads to nausea, sometimes vomiting, loss of appetite, and great difficulty eating. This is a problem because prolonged fasting triggers new porphyria crises for me, along with pain in my limbs and neuropathies resulting in lower back pain and lack of sensation in my legs. If I'm exposed to sunlight, finding it difficult to think clearly and express my ideas clearly. I feel there's a disconnect between real time elapsed and my mental perception of time. Additionally, it causes severe migraines, occasional absences and seizures, intense itching all over my body, very painful mouth ulcers, dizziness, episodes of constipation or diarrhea, and extreme fatigue. My family says I become very aggressive and I'm highly sensitive to loud noises. My living space must be completely dark as even a sliver of sunlight reaching my eyes feels like a stabbing pain triggering migraines. If I intend to watch TV, I have to set it to the darkest mode and wear dark glasses to tolerate the light. I have to use double blackout curtains to block out all light. The first images of the video depict my sanctuary in darkness. To enter the bathroom, I must plan it out carefully, as it's quite a challenge for me, being exposed to sunlight. If I'm exposed to light, I have to wear my UV-filtered clothing, gloves, hat, and of course, my dark glasses. I show the UV-filtered clothing, my long-sleeved shirt, also a long-sleeved undershirt, glasses, hat, and gloves as well as sunscreen for my entire body, also with UV protection. Here are the medications, 
glucose solution, infusion pump, IV sets, and everything needed for infusion. The problem is the phlebitis that follows due to the irritant nature of so much sugar, and the benefits are very short-lived. I hope this brief video can give you an idea of what it's like to live through a crisis day inside my body. All right, so I just wanted to show it's a little bit different. Uh, now, Arturo lives in Mexico and he is does not have um, uh, have uh, access to uh, Sinas or anything like that to to help him with it. So he has a bit different of a story, but um, I just wanted to show that because um, uh, the president of the Mexican uh, Porphyry Society had had shared that with us, and uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. So um, next, I would like to we have uh, we're presenting this together with the Canadian Association for Porphyrias, and we have the president of uh, CAP, uh, Michelle Capen, and she is an EPP patient as well, and she's going to share uh, her story with us. So, Michelle, if you can unmute yourself. And... Hi, Nicole. Hello. Uh, so, first of all, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michelle. I'm the Canadian Association for Porphyria president, and I'm also an EPP patient. Nicole, thank you so much for uh, hosting this. I've learned so much. As an EPP patient, I still learn... Uh, about my disease, my disorder uh, daily. And you know what? It's so nice to meet people um, who have EPP. Um, I have a very, very similar uh, story to George. So you may have seen me chuckling a little bit, uh, but I also, I think I went through the four stages of emotion, like happy, sad, you know, you almost had me in tears, George. I was like, oh no, I have to get a tissue. <laughs> um, but I was about 12 when I was diagnosed with EPP. Uh, no one in my family ha has ever had EPP before. Someone must be a carrier, but I'm, I'm the special person in my family that got EPP. I've tried all sorts of treatment, including beta carotene, which is what made me chuckle when George, George said that he was on it. I remember taking tons of pills as well, George. <laughs> and, and, I, I have a story of someone stopping me, a teacher in school stopping me uh, one year and saying, are, are, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, fine, why? I look a little orange. I'm like, oh, sorry, it's just medication I'm on. Like, I look like a carrot. Um, and uh, I've tried uh, light treatment. And what's different in Canada is that we have no treatments that are approved by Health Canada. Sinesse has not come to Canada. Um, we have a couple trials that were open to Canadian patients and one in particular that is open to Canadian patients, but the treatment is very, very limited. And so we have a much smaller population of EPP patients that are actually part of our organization because literally we have to teach our physicians how to diagnose. We can't, in most cases, we can't even find um, physicians. I remember when I moved back to the to Canada, they uh, I went to a doctor, and if you know me, I'm quite forceful. And he, uh, I said, look, I want to apply for SNS. I want to get treatment. There's treatments available out there. He said, okay, how do we do that? <laughs> and by the way, what is porphyria? I was like, you're kidding me, right? And this is in one of our largest centers in Canada, in Toronto, at Women's College Hospital. So it's been a journey, it really has. And I met my first EPP patient uh, when I was probably 35. So it's a relatively new experience for me. Um, we are very, very spread out in Canada. So um, it's hard to meet people who have porphyria. Since then, obviously I've met uh, quite a few patients who have EPP, but all of the things that uh, all of the people shared on the stories today about themselves, having a mom or a dad or a parent advocate for you as a child, as you know, as a young adult is super, super important. And I'm so thankful to have my mom who, my mom and my dad who pushed for that diagnosis, you know, that, that whole psychology part of it where, you know, George, I think you mentioned it, you know, they thought, oh, you need to go get psychological help. 
that is not helpful to a child. They, a child knows that there's something wrong with them. A, an adult knows that there's something wrong with them. And to be told that, that it's just all in your head, it's not. And I think even having that diagnosis is super important. George, you also talked about the trauma. I, I relate to that so much. Like I have two young boys and they love going to the beach and playing in the water. And I'm absolutely terrified of sitting on a beach. Can't think of anything worse. Give me, you know, one of those cabanas. No, like anything about a beach scares the crap out of me. <laughs> and, you know, with these new treatments, I'm hoping that will change. But um, as George mentioned, he's on one treatment. I'm actually involved in a clinical trial right now. And it's made a difference. You know, for the first time, I was able to teach my son how to ride his bike. Um, and, you know, he's like, but mom, mom, what about, you know, is the sun going to hurt you? And I was like, don't worry. It's okay. I'll handle it. You know, we'll deal with it. I think as EPP patients, we deal with a lot. We deal with that isolation. We deal with that trauma. We deal with wanting to be normal. You know, all these, uh, different clothing. We don't want to look different. We want to look the same. I want to wear pretty shorts and nice tank tops. Um, I want to go out and, you know, go on a boat. Uh, you know, I want to do all those things that every normal person gets to do. And, and it's tough having EPP. And it's definitely changed my life, but it's also probably made me who I am today. Resilient, strong, vulnerable. Um, we do a lot of, you know, we do a lot of education in Canada with our physicians, with our patients. And I know there are some Canadian patients on the line today. Hi, Lindsay. <laughs> um, I just, I love, I love who we are as a group. I love that we all come together and are just there to support one another. And I'd encourage you to keep doing that. Um, it's a, a really unique patient population and they really do care a lot about each other. And I mean, it's not just EPP, there are eight different porphyrias out there and they all present differently. And so it's tough, right? We are patients at the end of the day and patients have to advocate for, for themselves. And so I would say, keep doing that. But I don't know, I'm looking forward to the future. I'm looking forward to all these and I'm excited about these treatments that are up and coming and that they're in clinical trial finally might mean that we will get some relief, some treatment. And although it's not necessarily a cure, I'll take it. I'll take it if I can go out in the sun for four hours or five hours and enjoy, um, enjoy my life. Anyway, Nicole, I, I won't, I know it's been a long meeting and people have been really patient, <laughs> um, uh, but I love, I love that you've invited us and that we're co-hosting today. So thank you so much for everything that your organization does. You're definitely a stronghold in, uh, in the States and worldwide. And we all look up to you. Oh, thank you, Michelle. That means so much. And we, we have uh, our founder Desiree Lyon is on the line. I'm sure she'll appreciate that a lot, but um, we love working with you. And, and like you said, we are stronger together and um, just being here, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've learned from you about EPP. I, I just, uh, I just want to thank everyone who shared today. Um, Michelle, you you guys are doing such great work there and you have a lot of, you have a lot of, uh, compared to the U S you just have a lot of obstacles still to overcome, like you shared. And, and I just really hope that it gets easier, you know, but like you said, the future it's, it's bright, hopefully not too bright, but, um, use not a good word to use. Um, but basically, um, I, I just, I really hope that that, that, gets better for you guys, but, uh, you're, you're just, um, it's, it's wonderful to hear that you're doing better and you're able to, that's teaching your son how to ride his bike. And he's like, Oh mom, he's worried about you. That's just so sweet, yeah. you know, but I'm so glad you're able to do that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, uh, really excited of what's to come and it's okay. We don't mind bright. We just don't like sunny. There you <laughs> go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for being on here. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, George and Kim and Carly and Arturo for sharing his video and especially Dr. Buzzing. I thought she just did such a wonderful job. So we are recording this and we will get this um, for anyone that's missing it. We'll do a replay and we'll have it up on our YouTube channel. So thank you guys, everybody so much for, for staying on for so long and um, we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.
so much. Take care. Bye-bye.